All right, well, my name is John, and in the next few minutes, I'm going to go through a lot of scripture in the attempt to support the idea that God has, in fact, warned us in advance that what is being called the Mandela effect would actually happen at the end of days. I believe the prophecies that I will share lend additional credence to the claims of those of us that are trying to warn those around us that this really is happening. Uh, this phenomenon is a great mystery to say the least and it is very polarizing because you have people claiming that the Bible is changing which does not go over very well for obvious reasons so uh, my goal is to keep the tone and the choice of words loving and civil in hopes that we could all try to keep open minds until enough open debate has taken place. Just remember Rhoda in the book of Acts. She came to the door when Peter had supernaturally been let out of prison. She ran back into the prayer meeting to the Christians who were praying for Peter to be supernaturally released. And when she let them know, they all told her she was crazy. She was reporting a supernatural event, and the believers didn't believe her. And they called her crazy. And this is what's happening with those of us that are suggesting that this, in fact, is not misremembering, um, but that the, it, it's happening. And so let's just seek to keep the bond of peace before we start using terms like apostate, and heretic, and fear-mongering charlatan. Uh, these are just a few of the choice words that pastors have used to describe those of us that are suggesting that this is a real end times phenomenon. I believe the Mandela effect is real, it's happening, and it's been clearly prophesied in the Bible so that we could know in advance and avoid being deceived. Uh, one little housekeeping note, just for convenience, I'm going to refer to those that do not believe this is real as the unconvinced and those that do as truth seekers okay not that the unconvinced are not truth seekers <laughs> just a, t a handle for convenience sake nothing derogatory meant by either title okay so in just a moment i'm going to go through a number of scriptures so that you can at least consider the idea that god may have in fact allowed this to happen these scriptures will of course be in direct contradiction to the passages that seem to indicate that God would never allow his word to be changed. I believe these promises have been true as well. But what I believe I will show is that these promises to preserve the word of God were only given until the end of the church age, at which time they were to be taken away to fulfill God's sovereign will and divine wisdom. In other words, there is a clear indication from prophecy that these promises to preserve the word were time sensitive. So if you would turn, if you have your Bible, to Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. What we're looking at is, did God warn us specifically regarding the Mandela effect? Did God indicate in his word that he would allow the enemy to change the word of God? using some sort of black magic technology given to them by the fallen angels, whatever the technique is, we don't know. And so in this passage, you have the following verse, Revelation 22, verse 10. And he, said, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, the word I'm looking at specifically is the word seal, which is Strong's 4972. And it means this, <clears throat> to set a seal upon, mark with a seal, for security from Satan. Interesting, interesting definition. So, this passage then doesn't mean to don't close the sayings of the prophecy. In other words, make them available. It's not saying that. It means to not protect from Satan the saying of the prophecy. Okay? Seal means a mark for security from Satan. Therefore, it literally reads 
protect from Satan, not the sayings of the prophecy. Do not protect the Bible from Satan. Just let that sink in for a second. It's right there in black and white. Do not protect the Bible from Satan. Now, before you brand me an apostate, Revelation is obviously a very difficult book to interpret, and this passage may have dual meaning. Many might consider this, this word here specifically pertaining to Revelation only. There are a lot of different ways that you can interpret this. But I don't think you could get any more direct wording to describe God giving commandment that would allow Satan to fiddle with the Bible. So let's look at this a little more closely and examine the contents to ensure that we're exegeting this properly. The context for Revelation 22 is this. Verses 1 through 5 is a vision of paradise. But in verse 6, he changes to a warning of what is to come. Where we read, show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now in verse 7, we're told that whoever keeps the sayings of the prophecy will be blessed. Now, in light of the Mandela effect, I believe there may be a dual meaning in this passage. Meaning one, obviously, is obedience. But meaning two may be memorization. Blessed is he who keeps or retains the sayings because the sayings that were once there are going to become twisted fables and unrecognizable distortions of the original and those who have held the word in their heart will be sought out as we're going to see in other passages i'm not just pulling that out of thin air all right verse eight we are told that john the revelator falls down to worship the angel because of what is shown to him we are not told what the angel showed him that caused him to fall down and worship but perhaps what was shown to him is revealed in the next verse we read these words. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy. Seal, meaning a mark to, as to protect from Satan. Don't protect from Satan the sayings of the prophecy. Don't protect the Bible from Satan. Whoa! John falls down. He falls down. When he sees what God is going to allow in the last days, he falls to his knees. And he clings to this angel. He just grabs onto what's closest to him. But the angel says, don't worship me, worship God. But this may be a picture of why God is allowing this. God will purify our worship of him. And we're going to need to cling to him. Of course, if this is what's actually playing out in the scripture, then it would give a whole new light and meaning to the next verse, which says in Revelation 22, 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that's holy, let him be holy still. So maybe it says that. Because the act of removing the protection that was on God's word in the last days will result in people being unable to find God through his word. And so men will be trapped and fixed in the state they were in. There will be little remedy for men. They will be at such a great disadvantage that men will stay in the state in which they find themselves. Therefore, we read the statement, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. In other words, let him stay that way. God will remove this beacon of light and direction to him in the last days. Those of us that are believers will have to know their God, very much like Jesus said. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you find me, but eternal life. But they are those that testify of me. God never teaches us to know the Bible as he does teaches us to know him and so 
using scripture to inter interpret scripture, we go to Daniel 12, verse 4, and here we see a very similar directive from God, but it's the opposite. Daniel 12, 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, one commentary on this passage reads that many have, have observed the parallels between what Daniel and John saw in their respective visions. For example, Daniel foresaw a king arising from the fourth beast, or kingdom, who would persecute the saints of the Most High, and the saints would be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time, or three and a half years. That's Daniel 7.25. Very similarly, John saw a beast who was given authority to continue 42 months, again, three and a half years, and it was granted to him to make war. That's Revelation 13, verse 4. So, without a doubt, Daniel and John were granted visions of the same event, future to both of them. So if that's true, and Revelation 22 is speaking about the great end times event that includes the Bible being supernaturally altered and would certainly bring a great falling away, are there any indications in Daniel 12 of the Mandela effect as well? So let's look at Daniel 12:7. Daniel 12, verse 7, we see the result of something the enemy does that will cause it to scatter the power of the holy people. Well, the Mandela effect would certainly have that effect. And I, I just ask you to have patience. I know that some might be thinking I'm reading a lot into the scripture, but Revelation 22.10 is pretty compelling. It's pretty clear what that passage is saying. It's a matter of, is it, can it be properly exegeted to be applied to the entire Bible and not just Revelation and other ways of taking it in another direction? The commentaries obviously had other things to say than what I'm saying, but you can't possibly have interpreted that scripture without having first seen and experienced the Mandela effect and gone back to the word to try to find the indications of it in prophecy, which is, I believe, what it actually means when it says that these things are shut up until the end. They're shut up because you couldn't possibly understand this passage, what it would be saying until the event happened. And you're basically re re uh, reverse engineering it, essentially. So the next thing that's significant about these two prophecies is that the words used in translated seal have a different meaning. So verse 9 of Daniel 12, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed. This is Strong's 2856. It means to lock up till the end of time. Or I'm sorry, till the time of the end. So Daniel, we hear God saying, protect the word. It's essentially a behind-the-scenes look at God's promise to preserve his word. But notice it has a time limit till the time of the end. It couldn't be any clearer. And when the fullness of time has come, what was seen in Revelation 22 verse 10 will happen. The protection will be lifted. I believe that the Revelation 22 has been fulfilled in your hearing. It has happened. It is happening right now. Also notice that in Daniel 12, verse 10, because the word will be preserved and protected from Satan, you have the following result. Many will be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. But notice you have the opposite result in Revelation 22.10 where it is said that the Bible will not be protected. And then we have this similar statement. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, etc. It seems very like puzzle pieces fitting into those of us that are claiming that this phenomenon is happening and that God was, is showing us here 
that it would happen and the results of it. So several conclusions are these two verses are clearly an echo through time. They are linked for us through their similarity and therefore we can use scripture to interpret scripture. Daniel is told that the Bible would be sealed, in other words protected until the end of days. But Revelation 22 says the opposite. The Bible would not be protected from Satan. It's talking specifically about the prophecy of the book. It's saying the Bible would be allowed to be changed. Now you may not agree with my interpretation, but if you have conceded that the Mandela effect is really happening, then you probably do agree with my interpretation. But let's look at another one, because I believe the next one is maybe even more compelling. All right, now this next passage of scripture is a prophecy that seems to describe the Mandela effect. It's basically describing a famine of the word of God in the land. And that um, people will search for the word and not find it. it. It could definitely be clearly describing what the Mandela effect is like. So the question is, is it a future prophecy or has it already been fulfilled in some past event? So we're talking, of course, about Amos chapter 8 verse 11. It reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Of course, we couldn't possibly have imagined this passage being interpreted like you know, that it's being supernaturally changed and mangled until the Mandela effect had asserted itself. And then we began to notice it and then look into the word to find passages that describe it. So, you know, when you read the context of this, is there any indication that this passage speaks about the last days? Is there any inf inference to the last days in this prophecy? Because if there is, then it certainly could be applied to the Mandela effect and the claim that God did in fact warn us. <clears throat> now, before I do show this proof text, it references the sun going down at noon, which I don't believe has happened yet. So this proof text has to be interpreted in the light of the fact that the Mandela effect has asserted itself and is a precursor to this event. So this event is, in my opinion, imminent. Uh, if it has not happened already, and I don't know it, there was a, a uh, pretty compelling eclipse in August 27th, 2017, but it doesn't really fit the description of this. So um, anyway, verse 2 of Amos 8 <clears throat> And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. So it sounds like an end time statement to me. Uh, I'm sure you could interpret that differently, but I'm looking for any indication that this passage is, in fact, linked to end time prophecy. <clears throat> so verse 9 says, it shall come to pass in that day, and what day is that referring to? It's referring to the day that there will be a famine in the word, or a famine of the word. I mean, saith the Lord. So, it shall come to pass in that day, when there's a famine, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon. I will darken the earth in the clear day. So here, we're given a sign of when this famine of the word will take place. It's when the sun will go down at noon. It's a marker. If you compare that statement to what we see in Revelation 8, verse 12, <clears throat> which I believe has not happened yet, because it's quite fantastic, it says this, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and now it says this, and the day shone not for a third part of it. 
and the night likewise. So in Amos 8, verse 9, you have the sun going down at noon. Typically it doesn't do that. It goes down at 6 p.m. or whatever. But if you look at that, 12 noon is actually one-third of the day, right? From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It's four hours. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So noon will be one-third of the day. So Amos 8 says the sun will go down at noon, and Daniel says it was shown not for a third part. So again, these prophets are talking about the same event. This prediction is the sign in the sky clearly tying Amos' prophecy to an end times event. And what is that event that is not yet happened? According to that interpretation, it would be this event. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So, <clears throat> again, without having the Mandela effect in our thoughts, this could be interpreted many other ways. But now that this has asserted itself, we see this as a very clear prophecy of this event. So, Amos has a prophecy about a worldwide famine of the word. He then time stamps it with a celestial bookmark. In other words, this famine will happen the same time that the sign I'm giving you in the sky happens. It'll come to pass in that day. So as I mentioned, I don't believe that this sign has happened yet. And I believe that what we're seeing is just the early stages of the Mandel effect. And as it continues to go forward and things get more and more bizarre, then we will have the sign and it will be a confirmation. Very specific detail is given to describe the event and then we are given the same detail in Revelation 8. It's the same event, which means we have a proof text that the Amos prophecy is an end times prophecy. Additionally, this passage in Amos uses a similar phrase as Daniel 12, which is clearly an end times prophecy, where it says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. And Amos 8:12 says, they shall run to and fro. So, so far, up till now, we have two end times prophecies foretelling the Mandel effect. The first clearly indicates that God will allow the word to be changed. That was Revelation 22.10. And the second describes a time when the word will not be able to be found anywhere in this earth, or at least not in any recognizable form. But there is more. The next passage of scripture seems to be describing something that is hard to know for sure what he's talking about, but it says this. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, the commentaries are all pretty much the same, and as you might expect, they have a fairly naturalistic explanation. They render this to alter the forms and constitutions of kingdoms and the customs and usages of them, yea, to set up and pull down kings at pleasure, or to change the use of times and seasons by setting apart days as holy for canonized saints, appointing such days in a week, such seasons in the year, for abstinence from meats, and even to change the laws of God and man by dispensing with both and making new ones of his own. So commentaries were pointing to the Catholic Church dogma and the controls of the Catholic Church. But if you take Daniel 2, 21 into consideration, you have Daniel using a similar phrase that refers to the greatness of God in God's awesome ability to create and control the natural elements. It says this, Daniel 2, verse 21. 
Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Verse 21, now this is speaking about who God is. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them who know understanding. So when he says he changes the times and seasons, he's talking about God causing the summer, winter, fall processes. Something that's outside of anyone's control except God. Therefore, it's not unreasonable to suggest that Daniel is drawing from this word picture that he used previously here in verse 2 to try to explain, he's trying to explain the mad scientist type of activity that the enemy will be involved with in the last days. He's saying in Daniel 7 that the enemy will seek to try to be like God and try to change nature itself. But here's something very interesting. Daniel chapter 221, the word translated season is the word zeman. However, in Daniel 7, a different word is used. Strong's 1882 has been translated law 11 times and decree three times. So in the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, the word actually means the law of God. So guess what? We have yet another end times prophecy, clearly, clearly saying in no uncertain terms, there is no ambiguity here whatsoever. God is telling you in advance that in fact, the enemy would seek to change God's word, the Bible. And this passage insinuates a supernatural method that he will have the ability to alter space and time and the laws of physics to accomplish this. So what this passage is actually saying, in my opinion, in Daniel 7.25, He shall speak great words against the Most High, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he will think to change times and the law of God, the Bible. That's the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon definition of the word that's translated laws, times and laws. It's the law of God. And this beast, Antichrist, is going to think or seek to change the law of God. Now some of you just jump ship here. You said, well now you lost me. You're reading too much into the text. And, you know, it's because a lot of folks believe the word, but they don't really think the Bible addresses such things, you know, as scientific concepts. They brush it aside and, and they seek a more naturalistic interpretation. You know, like Genesis 6, they naturalize it as the sons of Seth uh, interpretation, when it's actually very fantastical. It's these fallen angels coming down and mating with women. It is what it says. Okay, for instance, Ecclesiastes 3.15 is a very interesting passage. It says, that which has been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requires that which is past. <laughs> now, there's some heavy words there, and you may have a more practical life lesson kind of interpretation of this, but the Bible does address science concepts more than most people know. However you may interpret this, I believe God is revealing to us some advanced concepts of time and the laws of physics here. My point is, it's important for us to consider that there are many times that we do not understand about the construct of the place we are placed into. We don't really understand how this place we live works. And so Daniel 7 may very well be speaking of a time when the minions of Satan in the earth may have access to technology that would allow them to modify time and the laws of physics itself. Right, so there really are people that knowingly work for the devil right now in positions of power in the world that have admitted to bringing this uh, to the world. Uh, these people are described in Revelation 16, verse 14. 
for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day. So this is describing demon-possessed world leaders working miracles. You know, we over-spiritualize the end days. It's actually happening with real people using real technology and real black magic, whatever, the, the, how they're doing it. Uh, these things are real, and they're actually happening. Okay? But we do take comfort in Daniel that it says he will think to change times and laws. Sounds somewhat like his efforts will be less than absolute, which is why I believe we see the residual evidence that we see. Only God does all things well. So I just say that to say I do stand on the interpretation. Uh, it's, it's a lot more supernatural than many Christians are comfortable to admitting to. Um, we've seen the theologians for centuries who've gone to extreme lengths to render the scripture of no effect by reinterpreting things that are clearly supernatural into that which is more manageable and according to their comfort level. So I just prefer a literal supernatural and an end times interpretation of Daniel 7, you know, context permitting. And um, I think this passage here supports that. Uh, Daniel 721, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. When will that happen? Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Well, that seems to indicate here that this power to prevail against the saints appears to happen in the end days because it isn't going to happen until what's described in verse 22, which is until the Ancient of Days come or came. So, the context of verse 25, one of my proof texts, is a future event. Some have suggested that times refers to a calendar, but that seems to be hard to bring that interpretation because why would changing the calendar wear out the saints or allow them to be prevailed against? And also, it just doesn't say that because the word time is the word zaman, which is a masculine noun meaning time. And the Bible says very clearly that he will change time, not calendars. Uh, the Greek word for calendar is very different. It's hypolio. I think I'm saying that right. Not zaman. So at this point, we have two end time prophecies indicating that God will allow the Bible to be changed and a third that clearly says the word of God will not be anywhere to be found. So are there any other scriptures where God is talking about his Bible being altered? Since God knew this was coming and there are other places where he warns those that will engage in this that they will be judged for fiddling with his word? Well, in Revelation 22, verse 18, we have that very thing. For I testify unto every man, this is Revelation 22, verse 18, every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. And again, we could not possibly have imagined that this passage could have meant something so exotic as God warning those that would be involved in using fallen angel technology to supernaturally change the Bible in preparation for the Antichrist's arrival. But now that these changes are happening and we're going back to the word for answers, we see it here as plain as day, that God warned us in advance that this would happen. I mean, if God wasn't going to allow this to happen, why did he put this warning into the Bible? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book. And you could choose to have another interpretation. Okay, but those of us who are completely persuaded that this is happening, are going to the Word, and we're seeing these passages, which seem to be clearly indicating 
that this has been foretold. You can hold a more reasonable interpretation that he's just referring to people who would publish perverted translations or altered text, but those of us that see these changes know what this passage is really talking about. It's been shut up until the time of the end. That's what that phrase means. You couldn't possibly understand some of these passages unless you were living in the time when these events were taking place. Then and only then can these passages make sense. They have been shut up until the time of the end. So, having addressed the first and main argument of believers that God would not allow his word to be changed, I would like to address the second most common argument that the Mandel effect is too impossible and too fantastic to believe. The devil does not have that kind of power. This is impossible. This is ridiculous. These are the claims of believers of the Bible, by the way. Do I need to remind you of the things that you believe, dear soul? The crazy... I mean, think of what atheists think of you. They think you're nuts because you believe the Bible. So let's just tap the brakes on the rhetoric that the Mandel effect is, quote, impossible or crazy because you don't understand it or you think it's too fantastic and that most importantly that the devil would not be invested with that much power okay but I want you to consider the next passages of scripture in light of those arguments first one is Revelation 13 verse 7 it was given unto him to make war with the saints make war with the saints it was given unto him to fiddle with the bible now it doesn't say that but it does say that the devil is given permission here to make war so you have to consider the the weight of what is god is saying is he's giving free reign to this enemy to come at us with who knows what, and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Talking about the enemy. Now, 2 Thessalonians is even more powerful. 2 Thessalonians 2 3 says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, and the son of perdition. Now, verse 9 says this, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So, when I read that, I said, What? wait a minute, all power. In my theology, in my understanding, of only God has all power. Yet, what we read here is the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write this passage using hyperbole. He's, he's trying to paint a picture of the enemy's capabilities that are so fantastic that the Holy Spirit allows Paul to use the term all power in relation to the enemy. It's an incredible doctrinal statement. Even him who coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's trying to let us know that what the enemy will be able to do at the end days will seem godlike. It'll seem like only God could do it but it will not be God. And men can acquire great power from the devil and do things that are unimaginable to most people. In Acts 8, verse 9, there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. This guy was not pulling a rabbit out of his hat. He had some moves. And then, of course, you had Exodus 7. And this is probably the most 
powerful, I don't want to use that term, but the most relevant example of the devil's ability to do things that we don't have any clue how he does. Okay, but the Pharaoh, when Pharaoh called the wise men, the saucers, and his magicians of Egypt, and they also did the same thing by their occult practices. So this is not sleight of hand. You cannot twist the scripture to suggest that this was just sleight of hand, that this, this didn't actually happen. It's clear, the Bible says, that they did this by their occult practices. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Okay, Aaron's snake ate their snake, but they still did it. They were able to change wood into a complex organism. <laughs> now, if you can't explain how Pharaoh's magicians turned wood into a complex organism, then how do you know that the Mandela effect is not real? See, we know from Genesis 6 that the fallen angels came down and interacted with humans so directly that they had children. But the book of Enoch gives us the backstory on Genesis 6 and tells us that they exchanged technology for continued access. So why couldn't we now be at a place where they can change more than just staffs to stakes? Hmm. If your enemy had the technology to change history going back to the beginning of time, what might you say about someone with that kind of a power? How about Revelation 13, 4? And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? I mean, if I can essentially change history, how are you going to deal with that? Who can make war with that? You might say this about someone that is able to calculate and program the superposition of any object at the molecular level, at the quantum level, using D-Wave computers, for instance, and the CERN particle collider to zap the Higgs boson field and tear the veil, as the Bible says. Because of quantum entanglement, they would then be able to reconstitute it however they please using the computing power of the D-Wave computer, which was uh, touted to be equal to 7 billion minds, and that was several years ago. It's exponentially more now. It was suggested that these computers will have godlike intelligence. They'll basically be doing alchemy on a global scale. So now I know that some believers are getting mad at me right now because I seem to be glorifying the devil. And you know, I love what Reinhard Bonnke says. He says, the devil's just a kitty cot with a microphone. I get it. He's a defeated foe. His days are numbered. He's under our feet. But we should not underestimate God's willingness to allow free will to run wild without intervening directly. Revelation 12:7 says there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Apparently, from this passage... Fallen angels don't seem to be powerless, defanged pushovers. So my goal here is just to illustrate that the enemy will be able to do things in the last days that will seem so fantastical that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use hyperbole and use the term all power to describe the enemy's ability. And how will he get Christians to worship the first beast if they have the Bible in its present form. See, it says that in Revelation 13. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Keep in mind, if he just confiscates the Bible, that wouldn't do it. He needs them to worship him willingly. So the Bible will need to be changed enough to where Christians will accept the blasphemy. Christians that refuse to open their minds to this will be slowly drawn into incredible blasphemy and eventually be able to justify in their minds worshiping the beast. Because after all, everything he's saying is in the Bible. But see, God has told us to know him, not the Bible. Revelation 13, 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. 
it's clear that bringing fire down from heaven is not his only trick because it says great wonders plural do you have any idea what the CERN scientists are claiming they're involved in maybe they have been able to do what they claim to be able to do in their sick occult laden video they came out in their video and they said they created the Mandela effect they've told us right in their video they're laughing at Christians and you say it's impossible but here's what the devil is capable of in Genesis 11 the Lord said if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them now similarly Revelation 17 speaks about these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast <clears throat> So if you're at all a futurist like I am and you study science and you understand some of the things that are taking place in these arenas, then you'll be aware of a concept called the singularity. It's essentially a term to describe when artificial intelligence becomes self-aware or sentient. And I don't think that we are given a lot of the backstory in the Tower of Babel. But many researchers are convinced that artificial intelligence plays a key role in what the Antichrist and his program will be all about. And I think that's referenced here in Revelation 17. I think that Genesis 6, I'm sorry, Genesis 11 verse 6 is the same as Revelation 17, 13. In other words, we really don't understand really what was happening at the Tower of Babel. Because this is one of those very few moments when God uh, had a insertion he interrupted free will. They, they overheard them. And they went down because they said nothing they plan to do will be impossible. So don't say it's impossible when God says that men can do things. They will, that they, nothing will be impossible to them. So the result of the singularity is that they had enough power that God said, they will be able to do anything. God does not interrupt free will by incursion very often. The Tower of Babel was one of them. Noah and his flood was another. This was more than a bunch of naive pagan primitives trying to build a big tall building so high that they could go all the way to God. You need to think more like what you read in Revelation 9 when you think about the Tower of Babel. It says this, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, and unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit the key to the bottomless pit that's a, a dimensional opening I don't think anybody would struggle with that interpretation dimension doors dimension portals Revelation 12 9 and I'm finished the great dragon was cast out and the old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives the whole world How's he going to be able to do that if the Bible is still in its present condition? I hope this has helped. And I really do look forward to your feedback and your comments. Uh, if I'm wrong, I want to know it. And I would like to invite you to respond to me at the email there. Um, or, And I will reply back as soon as I can. God bless.